This is the opening day news conference at the convention of the National Farmers Organization, December 1980, when President Devon Woodland fielded questions from reporters of the broadcast media, the press, and the wire services. The tape begins with Bill Wagner, NFO's communications director, introducing the news staff for National Farmers, and then Devon Woodland. Well, before Devon comes in, I'd just like to take this opportunity to introduce our news staff who are, will be working at this convention, since I assume you people will be coming in and out, and I certainly encourage you to. Uh, I'm Bill Wagner. I'm the Director of Communications for the National Farmers Organization. And I'll, yeah, well, we'll, we'll get Devon in first. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll shout, and I'll just introduce our people so that you know what they look like. Over there is Joanne Trussell, who works in our news department and will be in our news suite in 1357 and around the floor. Next to her is Carol Michaels. Standing in back is Dick Hazlett. Uh, John Cunningham will be taking pictures. Uh, I should have said photographer. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> Don Mack, who is the assistant director of communications, the producer of our radio show, and Phil Allen, who is our reporter, writer, uh, and general factotum of our Here's Info radio show. Uh, most of the things that are going on today at the convention, you'll get a few more details on that grain shipment that uh, quite a few of you have asked me about uh, from Devon. Uh, most of the things that are going on today are committee meetings uh, whose function is to pre prepare reports for the convention to adopt or amend, etc. Uh, I think there's something on the program this evening that a lot of you might like to attend, even if you wouldn't uh, write or broadcast anything about it. Uh, that's Dan Morgan of the Washington Post, who wrote a book last year that was quite a good seller called uh, Merchants of Grain. Uh, Morgan either won or was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize for his coverage of the Soviet uh, invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. He speaks tonight at what we call the ladies' meeting, but uh, it's about evenly split between men and women. Good evening to Poland after this. Pardon me? Good evening to Poland. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, he actually got involved in agriculture, agricultural writing. He was a foreign writer after the, uh, uh, the Russian wheat sale in 1972 73. He was there to cover it, and he decided to probe uh, the grain trade. Well, you've heard my uh, introduction. I guess everybody but Devon Woodland over there, who's our national president, and he knows our staff, so I will introduce him to you. Devon Woodland, he's from Blackfoot, Idaho. Uh, he's been president now for almost two years, so there you go, Devon. <laughs> First, uh, we welcome you here as members of the press and appreciate your interest in the organization and our goals and plans. Let me give you just a little background on the organization and its goals. The organization's goals were established years ago, and that is to, at some point, become the source of agriculture markets. Uh, heretofore, the markets have been established by the first handler, the major corporations, and we think it's unfair and just that they dictate income to American farm families. And the organization is determined that as manufacturers of farm commodities, that they have the right, the moral obligation, to operate like every other industry in America. And that is, those who manufacture have the right to price. And so the organization has established its goals. We are different than other farm groups. We are different wherein every member of the organization must have farm production. We have no affiliate membership nor do we enter into, in any way, farm service supplies or insurance programs. We are directly involved as the conduit between the buyer and the seller, negotiating the contracts, representing the producer. We never buy, we never sell. We are the medium through which the commodities do move from the producer to the buyer. And when sufficient strength is generated by the producer, then they will be in a position to negotiate contracts will re which will reflect cost production plus a reasonable profit for the producer. That's the goals of the organization, a little of the background in it. 
Now I'm open for questions. Are you optimistic uh, with a change in administration in Washington? How does your organization do that? What do you hope? To We're going to watch the uh, transition very closely. Uh, we are going to work uh, in full cooperation with the president-elect and the staff which he chooses. Our hope is that he will select for the Department of Agriculture a bona fide uh, producer, one who understands agriculture from the producer level. Our fear is that they may be oriented around the Board of Trade, the mercantile, which would not truly represent the interests of farmers and ranchers. Have any people in mind we have heard several names. We have not been asked for uh, recommendations or to submit names. Uh, at this point, uh, the names are so uncertain that uh, we have not centered on uh, any particular individual. We would feel more comfortable with some than others, but uh, we'll work with the president and the cabinet he chooses. How about Earl Butts? That uh, would be one of the remote choices that I've heard discussed. He has been a, a uh, one whom the president has confided in for agriculture policy programs, but that name has not been seriously considered, to my knowledge, as a secretary. What do you think the major issues will be confronting the Reagan administration? Well, the thing that we're going to be primarily concerned about is the transfer of land from this generation of farmers to the next. Uh, we think that that transfer is becoming uh, more remote uh, and more difficult to accomplish. And we believe that the owner-operator, the thing that makes this country great and different from other countries in the world, is ownership of land. And this organization will be pursuing programs that would protect and assist in that transfer of ownership of land from this generation of farmers and ranchers to the next. There's no question the surveys suggest to us that in the last 40 years, a geographic area equal to the state of Ohio has gone under asphalt and cement. And if that trend continues, in the next 40 years, we'll see another geographic area equal to the uh, state of Illinois. So there is uh, land being, uh, good prime farmland being used for urban development expansion, which is uh, a very serious issue. Food is going to become more and more critical uh, not only in this country, but in the world, in the years ahead. And uh, I think that uh, the knowledgeable people will tell you that farm production has peaked out per acre, per unit, and in some cases it's decreased. And uh, all indications are that uh, food and fiber will become top priority uh, in the years ahead, not only in this country, but in the world. <coughs> This is uh, part of the campaign rhetoric that there would be a state and uh, inheritance tax reviews to allow transfer of land to take place. And we think that that is <clears throat> important that it happen, and uh, we would encourage that to be pursued. Do you feel that the Secretary of Agriculture has diminished in importance not only in the role of serving uh, the production farmer? I don't think there's any question but what the role of the Department of Agriculture uh, has been uh, diluted some. Uh, that uh, by sheer percentages and by sheer numbers, it would suggest to us that we have a political atmosphere in the country that would cater to the 97% the consumer vote versus the three. We have a cheap food policy in this country, and we always have. I say always going back 30 years. And it doesn't make any difference who's in the White House, whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats. We seem to have a tendency or a desire to mother hen the whole world. And that food becomes a very important bargaining tool in international uh, bargaining arrangements. And uh, this is all done at the expense of the American farmer because he's supplying the food to this country and the world at below his cost. And he, in effect, is subsidizing not only the American people, but also the world. It will not change because of politics.
It will only change when farmers and ranchers organize and unite sufficiently in numbers. Their strength and their power is no longer in numbers, but it's in farm production. And when they organize their farm production, then they will have greater influence, not only politically, but in the marketing system in the country. And it will only come through farmers themselves. Politically, they have lost their influence and never again to be regained until they organize their power, which is food. What's your reaction to the government getting involved in international trade, one, the Russian, of course, uh, situation, and now Canada has said she's going to ignore her agreement. She's going to sell the Russians what they want to buy. Uh, what's your reaction to the government getting into these international agreements, whether they be an embargo or an agreement such as with China? Well, the government never has anything to sell. They don't own anything. They simply make arrangements for the agreements and then make those agreements available to the major companies and those who have the ability to supply and fill. I think the government has to become involved in that area uh, for several reasons. <clears throat> it protects the American people, which we are a part of and probably the greatest humanitarian of, of the American people. It also uh, gives the government some ability to negotiate. So the government must get involved at that level. Uh, but uh, the unfortunate thing is, is they have used those tools at their disposal to cheapen farm commodity and markets. And that's the unfortunate part of government involvement. And we think that farmers ought to have the right to pursue collective bargaining on the same concept that we see uh, the working uh, blue-collared uh, workers work under. And our goal is to protect their right to pursue collective bargaining. And uh, any interference by government or others to curtail or weaken that approach, we will be very vocal. That's our turf, and we'll be there to battle if it's uh, tempted to uh, uh, diminish that strength. What is your reaction specifically to that Canadian map? Well, I don't think it's any secret. Uh, the uh, third world countries have been supplying, either through a conduit of uh, a satellite, the Soviets have been getting grain all along, and much of it has been American grain. I'm sure that they would like to have it come much more direct to them, but this is no uh, secret to us that uh, many of our allies have been supplying grain to the Soviets. So uh, it won't be much of a change, really. It's just uh, another country has made it public. Well, probably more uh, fully disclosed than it has been, but I don't look for it to change much as far as supply and volume goes. What, uh, what's your answer to the consumers uh, when they complain that well, your goals of giving farmers a better income undoubtedly means much higher prices in the grocery store? What, what's your answer to the consumers? Well, I think the increase in the price of food is long overdue in this country. Uh, food is priced only after it leaves the hands of the producer. And then it is priced uh, uh, in relationship to cost and profit by those who handle in retail and wholesale. But the price to the American farmer is long overdue. It must come. There must be an incentive for him to produce and continue to supply that vital food. Uh, the American people are getting food today at the lowest and most economical of any country in the world of the highest quality. Uh, for example, the American uh, consumer is paying 13.5 of their disposable income for food. And if you add on to that liquor and tobacco, then it jumps to 16.9. So really, food is 13.5 percent of their disposable income. The lowest in the world, the next to it, is 28, and it goes from there on up to 65 percent of consumers' income for food. The American people have had a bargain and have never really recognized it or appreciated it. And it's time now that they're going to have to organize their priorities and understand that food is a necessity and that they must pay for those items rather than spend their income on luxuries. With agriculture so dependent upon exports, 35, 40 billion dollars for production that, what's the reaction of the National Farmers Organization all the emphasis on stopping the imports of Japanese cars, stopping the imports of various types of We're living in a world community. We can no longer isolate ourselves as a country. There was a period of time when uh, we were an island unto ourselves, but that's no longer the case. Your figures are correct. 
In 1970, we had about a $6 billion export in this country, and today it's jumped to $40 billion of agriculture export. It's the only industry that has any potential or possibility of bringing about a balance in trade. And uh, as we look at now the export, as it's now taking place, the analysts tell us that we are 10 years ahead of the projected needs in the world for export of American goods. And so it becomes now a very critical point wherein that we are exporting more now than we thought we would have to in the next 10 years. And so that demand is there, and it will continue to increase. Uh, agriculture must become a part of it. We must feed the American people, but they must learn that they have to pay for the food they get at an equitable price and return to the producers, or the incentive to produce will not be there, and you will see a continued demise of the American farmer and farmland will move into the hands of corporate and stock companies and farmers will become sharecroppers, tenants, and uh, the absentee owner of farmland will certainly destroy the quality of life in this country. Probably two cents per dollar, two percent uh, increase uh, would, uh, if that went directly to the farmer, Who's making the profits that we now sense? There has been an increase in escalation in farm markets. But you want to remember now that in order for the farmer to make income, he must have commodity. And too many of the bins didn't have a harvest this fall. Too many of the crops, too many of the acreage did not have a harvest equal to that uh, that uh, he uh, traditionally had planned on. So what he had, <coughs> what he had was fertilizer, taxes, uh, uh, chemicals, herbicides, uh, seeds that had all been invested in the farmland and this fall the crop did not yield equal to uh, projections based on previous years so he had all these costs in there and only a half we could even go to a 10 percent to a uh, whatever figure you want to choose because it was it varied that far so he really did not make the income, even though the market had escalated some. Uh, it takes two things to have income. First, a price, and second, a commodity. He had the price, but no commodity in too many cases. So uh, uh, for the bushels he sold, the uh, market had a reaction, but there were too many bushels that weren't there. Was that largely because of the weather? That would have been the weather, yes. That would have been the major cause as you look through the heavy agriculture area of the Midwest. It became very obvious that you drove down through and saw uh, what was taking place, and hopefully we do not have a repeat of that. All those stocks that we had been uh, uh, cautioned about and told was there simply are not there. They're not there. Well, the percentages and the numbers are not the important thing. Let me explain to you why. One of the major farm organizations, probably 60 to 70 percent of their membership are not farmers. They are affiliate membership operating in some phase of business or farm services. And so the numbers uh, are not important. Uh, one of the other major farm organizations is every family member is a member. And this organization, every member must have farm production. And so what you really have your strength focused in is the volume of production that you have within the organization <clears throat> versus the numbers of farmers. And as you know, in 1950, we had 6 million. Today, we have less or approximately 2 million. And so uh, the farmers are getting, uh, farms are getting larger, the numbers are getting smaller, and our goal is to keep it in the owner-operator concept. What is your current membership? Uh, it's a bargaining tool that we use when we go to the industry. I can tell you this, that we do $3.5 million of business per day, and that we are in all 48 uh, continental states and in 1,700 counties out of 2,200 agriculture counties. Can you tell us what percentage of the production is? We can get cost production contracts if we have 15% of the farm commodities. We do not have cost production contracts, so we don't have the 15%. Is it true that NFA refuses to divide 
It's a very confidential thing with us, and that isn't abnormal. You cannot get the membership roster of the Boy Scouts. You can't get it of the churches, and it's a confidential uh, part of our business. Can you tell us about this, uh, the demonstration of the plan later today with the uh, tractor-trailers and the grain? What's going to happen and why? Why are you having this? Yes, uh, the caravan that will be coming shortly, it's in the process now of being put together and will come here to the convention center, is a demonstration of strength and unity of the organization. It will not be a dumping uh, uh, action. It will simply be a, a demonstration of strength and unity uh, of the organization, and more specifically, the grain uh, department. And we represent dairy, meat, and grain and all facets within each of those commodities. And it will be going to a domestic buyer at a local facility. The caravan will come into the convention center and simply uh, demonstrate through a caravan concept, uh, and it will be uh, strictly a demonstration of strength and unity within the organization. And then it'll proceed, to proceed to a local facility, and it will be moved into a domestic buyers. How, how many trucks and how much grain? Uh, I don't have the exact numbers of trucks that will be involved in it. I'm going to guess uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100. Well, we'd uh, have to multiply that out on units. Uh, uh, I don't have that, Phil. Do you have the exact uh, tonnage that will be involved there? I don't know. I can't. I can't tell you the tonnage. Trucks, tractors, trailers, uh, semis, bobtails, uh, uh, ten wheelers. It'll be ex a combination, a hodgepodge of farmer-owned units. What is the uh, progress? We have uh, a structure put together in the organization that we call our Nationwide Collection Dispatch and Delivery System. The Nationwide Collection Dispatch and Delivery System includes not only grain facilities, but also dairy reloads and collection points for cattle. We have several hundred of these uh, across the United States, and they serve as an accumulation point for our members to bring in and assemble in mass or in volume a commodity uh, unit, whatever that is. And then as that's assembled in that facility, then we move that out in and under contracts to buyers. It may go export, it may go domestic, uh, but the one in Ohio is still being discussed. Uh, details are still being talked about. It has not been finalized. Well, the organization, in order to be successful, you must be in all commodities. You must have the ability to concentrate on any specific commodity that needs be and to cause your manpower thrust to be exerted in a specific direction. As I said, we represent milk in all the heavy dairy producing areas. Uh, we have contracts with all the major companies in milk. Uh, we uh, also have uh, uh, the uh, meat program, and we deal in feeders, fats, sheep, all fa phases and facets of the meat industry. We have that in uh, all the heavy cattle producing areas of the United States. Uh, and uh, then we go into grain. Now, grain is a very important commodity. It's so general in uh, geographics. It's uh, raised by nearly every farmer and rancher in the country. Grain is the key, and we must uh, exert uh, our uh, organizing ability our technical know-how into grain because it's the input item into milk and into meat and uh, grain is uh, really the key to agriculture bargaining and we're going to be spending uh, more and more time on that. It's a very uh, uh, compli complicated commodity. Um, it handles uh, in so many different ways and so many different directions, ports on every coast and uh, uh, it's um, yeah, the industry is well organized, and their goal is to buy it as cheap as they can, and uh, their tradition has been successful. They, what they about have. Uh, the NFO's stand on farmer-supported promotion for the end product, such as the pork set aside, the, the soybean association, their set aside? What's your reaction for 
Well, advertising uh, has uh, always been an important part of moving agriculture commodities. Uh, our main thrust, of course, is to get cost production at the farm gate. And uh, our emphasis will be on that. The farmer needs cost production at the farm level. If those promotional advertising costs become a part of his uh, operation, they become a cost production, and they'll be figured in his needs in order to return his uh, uh, full cost production. We have no opposition to that. Uh, we are uh, somewhat uh, narrow-minded, uh, tunnel vision. We're going to stay specifically on bargaining for the raw material at the farm level. And for a referendum such as coming up in Indiana on soybeans and talking about how the nation might be and so forth, you'll neither support nor detract from it. That's right. It's not a part of our program. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Say one more thing. I mentioned to most of you, I think, that I would find.